Welcome back to the channel. In this video, we're going to discuss some of the equipment I've been using to make these videos on YouTube for the last four years, uh, but mainly just 2021-2022. Uh, some of you that are only subscribed to this channel may be surprised to learn I have another channel where I focus more on mechanical content, tool reviews, stuff like that, like out in the garage, working on vehicles and stuff. I started that channel just about exactly four years ago to this day. So this is kind of the, the four year equipment wrap up. I did one of these uh, almost as soon as I got started on YouTube, just like here's the absolute crap that you can use to get started. And then I intended to do another one every year to just kind of show the follow-ups of, you know, what worked, what didn't, blah, blah, blah. And then didn't for the last two years. In 2023, we're making a big jump as far as technology of how I'm recording things and stuff like that. So this is a perfect time to get caught up. If you don't care at all about this kind of thing, don't sweat it too much. We won't be doing this kind of content all the time. I plan to do one of these one time a year. And I'm doing it over here because this is the tech channel and this is all a bunch of tech stuff. On the contrary, if you're one of the people that can't get enough of this kind of stuff and you want to know about the business side of YouTube and all that stuff, like I did incorporate an actual business for doing this, we can talk about that too. I may not do it on this channel, but certainly something that I could do. I also have my email address in the description of every video I've ever made, I think. Uh, if you have any kind of specific questions or anything, feel free to ask. Uh, I will tell you that if you haven't been paying attention, I am not an expert. So I'm not the guy to go to if you're trying to learn how to become a filmmaker. But if you are completely lost and don't even know where to begin, I can at least tell you, you know, how to push that button and do that thing to get started, I guess. So let's go ahead and get started. So that is the actual start of the channel. This is just barely even a video camera. This is an ancient Canon camera that will shoot 720p video. About the first 10 videos on the channel were done with this. I don't suggest you do this. I'm going to put this away now. Almost immediately as soon as I started, I went to a smartphone. This happens to be an LG K20. There is nothing particularly special about this phone except that when I started YouTube, I did not use a smartphone at all. It's kind of an odd story how a guy in 2019 wasn't walking around with one of these things, but I just never really needed one and I never paid attention to the market and noticed the prices coming down, so I never got one. This one was a budget model when I got it. Uh, it's insanely obsolete now, but it did the job more or less just fine. Right after that is when I bought this guy, I think. And I thought this guy would be the end to all of my camera problems. This is a generic action cam, so it's a generic GoPro. You might hear me jokingly refer to this thing as a no-pro. I don't think this particular one is available anymore, but I doubt it matters. This one is an Asako K7000, I think. These were extremely popular under a bunch of different, you know, different name brands. It's 50 bucks, something like that. The model that came after this one is image stabilized and has a touch screen. This is not a touch screen on the back of the thing. So you've got to navigate everything just with like little buttons and stuff on the side. And I think the newer model is, I don't know, 70 bucks. They're not a lot of money. They're compatible with, you know, the, all the generic waterproof cases. I think these are, cases are actually compatible with GoPros too. All the GoPro mounts are compatible. So for seven or eight bucks, you can buy a set of, you know, different GoPro mounts and stuff to do things like bolt it to a chest rig, which is what this is. I think I bought it with the camera. So you can put on this harness and run around with a camera strapped to your chest if you want to. I almost immediately discovered the sound on this thing is fairly terrible. I also discovered that having it not motion stabilized is also kind of a problem. This thing is good for a few things, but not good for a lot. The sound coming out of the LG K20 is also fairly terrible. So I maybe made with these two guys kind of as they are, maybe another 10 videos or so, maybe five videos, not many before I got mildly more intelligent and realized that my earphones that I've been using for the last 10 years with an iPod and everything else had a microphone made into them. So from that point forward, I was plugging these guys into the phone and anytime I would be using this camera, I would be you know, double tracking it with the phone as well. So even if I didn't need the video from the phone, I would be using the phone to record audio through the microphone on this, even with that camera. And this solution was okay. This went on for probably 30 or 40 videos. We did pretty well with this. Oh, during this time too, I was also doing all my editing with a Dell E6410 laptop, which on my The Broken Life channel, I have a handful of videos about those things. It's a 12 or 13 year old original i7 laptop. Not suggested anyone invest in that platform, but it worked. Uh, the first probably 30 videos, 40 maybe, were edited with Windows Movie Maker. Uh, that's still in some name available with Windows now. Windows 11 comes with an editing, editing package, or you can download one anyway. So you certainly can get started with junk and keep moving up. And that's kind of what you're seeing here. But this junk served me pretty well. 
Somewhere in this timeline, I also upgraded all the lighting in the garage. If you only watch this channel, you may not be aware that I've made like 250 videos out in the garage in this place. I also don't know if I've said very often on this channel that I rent the place I'm living in. That makes me somewhat limited for what I can do for lighting and stuff. But I already have a pretty comprehensive video, or actually I think a couple videos, from when I did what I did in the garage for lighting, and I'll link you to those if you want to go see them. But basically they're just a bunch of hardware store LED lights that didn't mess with the cameras eh, too much. Uh, again, being an idiot that I am, things like frame rate and f-stops and all that stuff still don't really mean all that much to me. I just set up stuff to, you know, not get a whole lot of LED flickering and found some cheap stuff that worked okay at the time. So we were rolling with this stuff and that lighting for quite a while. The next thing that came along, which I just thought was the dumbest thing ever until I got one, was this camera handle. I was making a video one day, it was super hot outside, and I was, you know, just holding the phone as one does when you're, you know, trying to make a video. And I was just shaking like a crackhead, and I still don't really know why, I think maybe just too hot. But having like a, you know, a pistol grip style little tripod deal like this just makes all the difference. It makes the camera so much easier to deal with. And these things are like 12 bucks. It has also been ridiculously handy more than once, because it doubles as, you know, a little tripod. You, know, you can set the angles and do stuff like that if you want, especially like under a vehicle or whatever. The downside here, of course, is you can't see the screen. You'll notice that in a lot of my videos that I'm way overexposed or stuff like that because I'm looking up. This is why. But yeah, for what these things cost, they're great. In fact, this is the second or third one I've had because I just break them from time to time because I'm just, you know, hard on stuff. If you, if you have an activity-based channel, you're going to be hard on your gear and that's just the way it goes. But I think the next thing that came along, which I also thought was dumb until I got one, was a ring light. These things are fantastic. Uh, again, this one was like the cheapest one I could get. Uh, over the years, I've gone through a couple of these mounts that actually hold the, the phone mount into it. That's actually a, a moderately decent one, but all this stuff probably wasn't more than, you know, 30 or 40 bucks. Kind of the problem with this guy is he's USB powered. So again, if you're an activity-based channel, that is a problem. I already had one of these, you know, USB battery packs just because I had one. So for a long time, I would just have the phone either on a tripod or with the hand mount with the ring light running off of the battery pack. Yeah, just like so. And this was actually a pretty good solution for a long time, but it run this light for you know about as long as the phone itself would run anyway. And I've used this ring light in I would say almost every video I've ever made. The part of this operation that didn't stick around long was this guy, because I found out pretty quickly that I wanted to be able to charge both the phone and run the light kind of indefinitely especially when working like under a car or whatever, because then the ring light would actually become my shop light. So that is when I took the same old tripod I'd been using forever, like this $12 guy here, and strapped a big battery pack to it, which was a stroke of genius. That should have happened way before it did. Again, I think that battery pack was 60 or 70 bucks. And that's kind of the, the theme of what you're going to see here is there are a lot of like $50, $60 bites along the way, because most of the stuff I was buying uh, before I was even monetized. So these are all things that are just coming out of my pocket. So the stuff you see me do on the channel, of course, it costs money if I got to buy car parts or computer parts or whatever. But then, you know, the equipment to make the videos costs money too. So some months it could be like a, like a $500 month for, you know, for YouTube, despite the fact that the stuff I needed to get done anyway or whatever. But yeah, this stuff gets expensive. So just buying, you know, tiny little pieces when I could just to keep making things incrementally better as we go. I think the next big thing that came you know, right after this setup was transitioning to Vegas Platinum for my editing software. Uh, I found out when you're trying to like multi-track a you know, couple different cameras or a couple audio tracks and stuff like that, that you know, I outran the capability of Windows Movie Maker pretty quickly. So basically as soon as I started using this guy for all my sound, regardless of what I was doing with the camera, I was out of luck. So I moved into that as an edi editing package. And that was drinking from a fire hose for a while. Uh, I have no background or training in anything like this. So even, you know, just having a multi-track recorder was something foreign to me. I went with Vegas expressly because that is what Fuzzy Dice Projects uses. Uh, once upon a time, Fuzzy watched one or two of my videos. Guy's probably too busy to do it now. But I really enjoy his channel. I think he does a great job making videos. Uh, so it's like, hey, good enough for him, good enough for me, I'll give it a shot. I think he's using um, full-blown Vegas, so not Platinum. It's a weird naming conventions, how they do things. I started with Platinum 15, which was a version that was a couple versions behind at the time. It was, again, a $50 upgrade. Um, this year I moved into 17. Uh, it's a lot of the same. No real huge changes. We could talk more about that in a different video. Uh, 
but there are plenty of free video editing packages out there. A lot of people just edit video right on their phone. I don't think I've ever owned a phone powerful enough to do that, but there's a lot of things you can do. So that is the setup that we ran for a while. I think the next big changes all came about right around the same period of time. Got a new phone. This guy is an LG V30. It's several years newer than the guy back there and most critically is image stabilized. Also most critically, the image st stabilization on this phone is terrible, so I never even used it. But it does have a much larger screen, it was easier to look at. The downside is, I always felt that the camera in this thing, it also has a wide angle camera, which we've used a time or two. But most critically about this thing is, I never really even liked the, the picture that it produced as well as I did the old phone. I contemplated many times going back. But this became my, my YouTube phone. I never carried this phone. It hardly ever left the house unless I was making a video out somewhere. Uh, that was very intentional because if I should ever drop it or something and it's got all that content on it, you know, that would be potentially bad for me in more ways than one. There could be, you know, potentially personally revealing information on it that doesn't need to be out in the world. Plus I would have lost my content out in the world. I tend to be pretty good about backing things up almost immediately. We'll talk more about that later. But all the same, I just never actually want to carry around something I'm using or relying on to make content. You know, if you're into cloud storage services or whatever, that might be fine for you, but not something I would personally do. So anyway, we moved up to this guy, despite it really not being much of a move up. And maybe for just a handful of videos, we were still using the old headphones here. But this phone has a much more advanced camera app uh, than the old one as well, and would let you control things like mic gain, so how loud the volume of the microphone going into your recorder is. But for whatever reason, it wouldn't retain that information. Now maybe I could have downloaded a better camera app or whatever, but it just didn't work out for me. So I was blowing these headphones out constantly. My audio was always way too loud for the preset in the camera, so I'd have to manually try and remember to turn the mic back down every time you would go in and out of the camera mount, the camera app, or I think even when the screen would go to blank like that, it would re-zero the mic. So that became unusable almost immediately. I also, by then, I mean, we're probably, I would say a, a good solid year into YouTube, probably more than a year into YouTube at that point. I'd gotten way sick of being tethered to the phone all the time. You know, this is okay if your phone is in your pocket or if you're you know sitting at a desk working. This sucks real bad if you're trying to work on a car. It is a real problem to be tethered to your device like this. At the time, the Bluetooth devices were either way too expensive or way too crappy, and there were wireless mics, but it was the same deal there too. I could spend like $2,000 and buy a set of mics that, uh, actually, I think I think Hoovy's Garage back then, I was, I was still watching him. He actually had the set that I had passed through that were like two or $3,000, and he made a video where he was complaining about how they didn't freaking work. So that put me off of that as a whole concept and stuff like the Rode Wireless Go 2s. I don't think we're on the market yet or if they were, I was just too dumb to know it. But either way, that would have been a two or $300 mic setup and I didn't have the kind of money to do that right then anyway. So once again, another $50 solution, I bought a voice recorder. There's nothing particularly special about this. This one happens to be a Sony. You know, you can plug a microphone into it. You can plug headphones into it as a monitor if you want. Some people use these things to play back MP3s or whatever. It was not a lot of money. It's fairly well featured and it's super easy to use. And most importantly, it remembers your microphone gain settings. And it's also super dumbed down. You know, like it just has a little menu where you can set sensitivity. External input setting would be your mic. So mic in, sensitive setting for voice. And it's just, you know, low, medium, high. I always keep it at low because I can boost it in software just fine. I tend to speak kind of loudly anyway. Uh, so yeah, just the dumbest thing possible. Worked really, really good for almost every single video we've made, including the one I'm making right now. By the magic of owning two of them, which is a topic for just a minute here. But primarily why I selected this model is it didn't cost a lot. And at the time, I think I had just watched an HBO show called The Jinx. I don't even remember what the show was all that much about, except a guy kind of outed himself as a murderer at the end, like in real life. And that guy's in prison now. But for a lot of the interviews they did with this guy to just illustrate the interview going on, they would just show this guy on the table with the VU meters running. I'm like, well, if it was good enough for HBO, it's good enough for me. And it was, you know, 50 or 60 bucks. So we did that for a little while, but not too terribly long. Probably about another 20 videos, maybe. Because I came to discover once I was no longer tethered to the camera, 
Now, so the cord wasn't straight out in front of me like that, it would be going onto this guy in my pocket that the microphone would rub on my shirt. And this became a real problem in the winter time when I was wearing a hoodie or something, or something with a zipper, because it would snag across it and you could actually hear that popping and clicking in the videos. If I was uh, like kind of sitting back in a chair and wanted to do like some narration or something, it would also like, you know, rub across a t-shirt and you could hear that too. I still use this guy for like phone calls with work and stuff. And I wonder if people hear that crap when I'm on a call too, but I also don't care. But anyway, that was unacceptable for YouTube. So it wasn't too long after this guy came along that these guys left and these guys showed up. That is a Rode Lavalier mic. I think it's just the Lav 1 is the model number. I'll, I'll link all this stuff in the description for you. This guy in combination with this guy was the ticket I was going for. Get the Lav and get it actually, you know, clipped to a shirt and get it not making noise and stuff like that. This is when I made a few critical mistakes that cost me money and cost me more videos than they should have. And just because I'm stupid more than anything. These Rode lav mics use what's called a TRRS connection. And like, uh, you know, this voice recorder and most regular recorders with a three and a half millimeter jack don't. They use what's called a TRS connection. So you have to use a little adapter to make them work. Well, this thing, which this particular one happens to be the real deal one from Rode. These were stupidly expensive for what they were. These were like 30 bucks or something at the time. So I bought some generic Amazon ones for like 10 bucks. And that was a massive mistake. So what happens is the contacts in them break down pretty quickly. As you can imagine, as you're walking around and wearing this stuff and, you know, plugging this guy in and out of your computer and doing, you know, active stuff, you wear down these connections quickly. I don't monitor my audio as I'm recording it. This isn't a podcast. I don't have a producer. But what would happen is you would start hearing clicks and pops and stuff on the audio tracks. And sometimes they'd be really bad, like unusable quality bad. So after way too many years, I decided to buy the official Rode adapter for the way too much money they cost. Definitely worth it. Haven't had a single problem since then. And that's probably been 70 or 80 videos ago. So that was one critical mistake I made, but we made it work. This in general, this setup has been great for the money I spent and especially because I could buy it in increments. You know, it's 50 bucks, it was 50 bucks, it was, you know, 30 bucks, whatever. I didn't have to throw out a huge bunch of cash all at once. But another mistake I made along the way was not realizing that you could get actual road branded windscreens, which these are not. These are generic Amazon windscreens. They work okay. They slip on over like the foam windscreen on the road, but they kind of don't hold on all that well. And then eventually I lost the windscreen and the foam. So again, just because of stupidity, I bought a pack of new foams and more windscreens, not realizing that you can just get the road windscreen, which is all integrated. Again, road's kind of proud of the price of their stuff, but this is far and away the best way to go and would have been cheaper in the end than messing with this stuff and just so much better. But yeah, what I'm actually using right now that you can't see is one of these road labs with this windscreen on it. And the windscreen never comes off of it. It works just fine in all conditions. Oh, and there's a quick addendum I should add that all of these devices were intentionally selected because they all can have their own SD card. This guy has a 64 gig SD card in it, I think. It's way, way more than I could ever actually use. It's like days and days and days of recording at CD audio quality, like uh, uncompressed PCM quality. This guy, I think, has a one terabyte card in it, and this guy has a 512 gig card in it. I only expressly mention that because trying to shoot and retain video on your phone, like the guys who do this with iPhones, I don't know how they do it. These two phones also have removable batteries, which is becoming, you know, another thing of the past. But yeah, all this stuff will take uh, micro SD cards, which is very important. Once they're in, you never take them out. You just transfer data over the USB connectors in the bottom. Important thing to consider is how you're actually going to manage all this data you're going to end up with. We'll touch on that again in a little bit. Oops, later never came, so I guess we're going to do it now. Data management is kind of a thing. Meh. Very seldomly would I ever delete anything, even abandoned projects, which if you do any kind of YouTubing at all yourself, uh, you'll know sometimes they just don't work out. So everybody has some that are kind of up on the shelf. But regardless, I hang on to all that stuff. I hang on to it forever, both raw footage and finished projects, and that takes a ton of space. So these are just archival drives. I don't work off of these typically. Uh, each one of these is eight terabytes and they are mirrors of each other. So I frequently preach that it is not a backup if you only have one copy of it. So primary copy and the backup, you know, YouTube 1A, YouTube 1B. Someday soon there's probably going to be a, you know, a YouTube 2 as these drives get full. Not saying it's the best way or that it's the right way, but it's the way I do it. 
Now onto the magic of why I own two sets of this stuff. I've been pounding around out in the shop with this audio recorder set up for a long time, probably, well, not quite a year, I would say, and dropped this thing a bajillion times. It might be hard to see, but the one I'm actually using right now is actually really beat up. This screen is all bungled up from getting hit with brake clean and stuff. These things have taken a beating. Well, one day it took one beating too many and it locked up, it locked all the controls. I couldn't even turn the thing off. It was still under warranty with Sony and they were really cool about it. In fact, before I even sent it in, it had unlocked and I updated the warranty claim. And I said, Hey, you know, this thing is actually unlocked, but you know, I, I actually use this for business. I don't particularly trust it. They're like, sure. No problem. Send it in. And literally as soon as they got it, they just shipped me a brand new one. Um, they never even diagnosed the old one as far as I know. It might be because these aren't even worth them trying to troubleshoot. They're such a, an expensive consumer product or whatever, but that's what they did. They took care of it almost immediately. But anyway, this guy did spend, you know, some time away from home because of that problem. So we were back to using phones for audio. So what I was trying to do was use this phone much in the same way that I was using this guy and it just wasn't working out. I was having mic gain issues. Uh, this phone is so much bulkier in my pocket than, you know, this guy was that it was really bugging me, especially since I, uh, in the summertime, will intentionally wear cargo shorts. So I do have an easy place to put this guy that's down my leg a little bit. So if I'm laying on my side under a car, I'm not just crushing it, that it's, you know, actually got a place to hide. And none of that was happening with the phone. I'm like, you know what? I like this thing. I've broken one already to, to no fault of its own. I dropped it. You know, it is what it is. And I told Sony that and they were super cool about it. So I just went ahead and ordered a second one. So yeah, that's how I ended up with two. Another thing I discovered very quickly is that I snag these cords on stuff all the time. So while I was at it, you know, I have at that point, three cameras, a fourth, if I get really desperate, two voice recorders, like, okay, I'll just buy another smart lav just to have it. And when I decided to make the jump to these converters, I just bought two when I did it. It's like, okay, now I have redundant mic setups. I'm fully covered. If something ever goes wrong again, I'm not at some crap solution. At that point in the game, I was getting paid to make YouTube videos. I get paid to make them right now. Not on this channel, but hopefully this year we'll get there. But I had a little bit more money to work with and was a little bit less afraid of making investments straight into stuff just for YouTube because YouTube was you know, a job is a business that, you know, is making revenue. It still doesn't make money, but it does make revenue. If you don't know the difference, what I'm really saying there is that it easily outspends itself. I can spend more money than the channel makes without any trouble whatsoever. So yes, especially if you have an active channel, I recommend having spare everything. Because the one thing you, you don't want to do if you have an active channel is stop your activity because your equipment lets you down. Uh, it's happened to me a whole bunch of times and it really sucks. Uh, sitting with like a vehicle torn apart in the shop for a week or, you know, a couple days because I don't have a mic that I'm comfortable with or whatever. You know, that's not something I like doing. While I'm on this general subject, I'll also say that audio is a lot harder than you think it is. I watch channels with people who are like professional sound engineers and pro professional music producers who have, you know, put music into the world that you've probably heard on the radio at least once. And sometimes they have garbage sound. They'll be blowing out their mics and everything else. As long as I remember to actually hit record on this thing, this is actually a really good solution. The part about it that sucks is I have to manually match up the sound clips with the video clip from the camera. There is software that will do that for you automatically. I think the next tier up of Vegas might do it. In fact, the version I have might do it. I need to look into that. But for the last, I don't know, 300 videos I've made on YouTube, including this channel, that's not what I've done. I've done it all by hand. And then somewhere along the way, probably about the time I started making 3D printing videos, I ended up needing some like actual lighting for my desk, which is what those guys are. And they're actually cooler than I even thought they were when I forgot first got them. They're just newer, like little USB powered kind of just junky lights. But they're on these extending tripods. So you can boom them up in height and get a you know a nice aerial light. Like everything we've been filming is right there and they're doing an okay job. And again, I think those were, I don't know, maybe 20 bucks a piece, something like that. They, they were not a whole lot of money. And I think while all that was going on, one of the few places where I did spend a lot of money in one chunk was my laptop, my editing laptop. This is the Dell 7440. It has been on the Broken Life channel before. I repasted it. it in fact, it'll be on the Broken Tech channel soon because it needs a cooling fan put in it. But this is what has edited almost all the videos in the last two years. It's like a third generation i7, 16 gigs of RAM, whereas the 6410 is maxed out at 8. 
But most importantly, this is the most advanced laptop Dell ever made that still supports an ePort dock. So this guy has docking stations. You can just see one right back there under that monitor or behind that keyboard where it just snaps in kind of like a video game console game. I really like that. I've got a million of those docks. So I, a couple years ago, ponied up and got this guy. And when I say ponied up, I mean, I think it was $300. It wasn't a ton of money. It takes forever to render video on this guy. It's about a 10 to one ratio, depending on what effects and stuff you have on the video tracks. But I'll say for me, it's usually about 10 to one. So if you have a one hour video, it's gonna take 10 hours to render. Not a great situation to have, but you know, it worked for a while. These days, what I do more often than not is do my rendering on the custom built PC that came from the Dell 3880 series on the Broken Life channel. So that series, is just like the HP series is on the Broken Tech channel, where I bought a Storebox PC and upgraded everything in it, and at the end of it, I had two PCs. So the custom PC I built from that series is now my video editing rig. So it's a 10th generation i7 with 64 gigs of RAM, I think. It might be 32 gigs, way more RAM than it needs. Crappy video card, does a fine job. Most, mostly it's just got a fast SSD in it, a much more capable processor and a lot more RAM. But yeah, so that's what we're, been using for mm, the last 20, 30 videos, something like that. And then this guy I will sometimes still uh, use it to edit and maybe not render. Like I'll save it off and move it over. Or if I'm away from home, this is still the work laptop that goes. So that brings us up to pretty much present day. So one big change for the channel is I got a new tripod a while ago and it does all kinds of neat things. Some of which I don't use a whole lot. Like these are all like viscous dampened connections. Like that's kind of as fast as I can turn it. So it does super smooth panning shots and stuff. So I can get more artistic if I want, and maybe someday I'll learn to. But more importantly, at least as it regards this channel, is that arm can extend all the way up and lay over, and you can put it in an angle. So for instance, for working on computers and stuff on this channel, I can fly the camera up over a computer case and get like a you know an aerial shot that's a little bit more easy for people to see than like trying to you know point a camera sideways into a case and try and work on it and stuff. So once again, just one of those incremental improvements that came over time. I think the tripod was a little more spendy, probably about 150 bucks or so. But that's kind of the point we're at now. And speaking of spendy, this is what we're actually going to be using for videos going forward. If you watched One Drawer December, where I did like a little mini toolbox tour every day in December, this is the camera that did all those videos. And this camera is one of the reasons I did that video series. So I wanted to be able to make some, some quick content, kind of, quick in a hurry to just get used to using this camera. As it turned out, like October, November were actually pretty good months for the channel financially. I had been hoping to squirrel away enough money to move on from these guys and go with something like the Rode Wireless Go 2, or more than likely the new DJI version of that concept. The DJI setup is, you know, like 300 bucks, something like that. I was hoping to stretch to do that, but then out of the blue, we had a great month or two and was able to stretch to do the camera. It's not at all intended to be like a humble brag kind of thing when I say that that thing was expensive, at least for me. As it sits, that's just like the stock lens that comes in a kit. Uh, I bought a couple batteries for it, bought a couple different wrist braces for it because I'm just terrified of dropping it. I'm kind of terrified to use it in the shop, to be honest. But more or less, by the time you end up with any kind of a quality camera at all, you're in it for a grand. I was 100% in this thing for a grand. And I'm lucky that December pushed on to be like an all right, not awesome, but okay month. Cause I was kind of hoping it would be, and it was. That's the only reason that that was also feasible. Took a few risks, it worked out. The big problem now is I'm just too ignorant to know how to run this thing. There's a very real chance that I'm gonna have to take like a class to understand how this camera works. It may as well be a spaceship compared to what I'm used to. I've never had a real camera in my life, just like point and shoots. Oh, I'm not sure if I even said this is a uh, Panasonic Lumix G95. So when I say real camera, this is still not technically a, a real camera. This is what's called a four thirds camera. So this is still like the very bottom end of anything that could be considered like, I don't even know if professional is the word, like hobby grade. As soon as you get outside of Walmart and go into an actual camera store, this would probably be the cheapest thing they would have in the store. But so far so good, I think. Like I said, it's way more capable than I am. Right now I just have it turned to dummy mode so it's doing everything automatically. And every time I deviate from that, it gets worse. So. <laughs> I'm just letting it do its own thing. It's fairly incredible in terms of what it can do. And of course it's a, you know, an SLR camera so I can put different lenses on it that will do things that I don't understand and all kinds of neat stuff. 
I started literally about as humble as you can. Uh, just before this video for fun, I looked up the price on this Canon camera on eBay. You can get these things for like $30. This one's practically brand new. I really didn't use it a whole lot uh, after I bought it because I bought it more as a like a photo camera. And then photo cameras became obsolete almost immediately after I bought this thing and everything was you know, a video camera that will take pictures. And now the, the chain has come back around and these DSLRs are becoming the more professional but low-end way of taking video now. So you definitely can start on YouTube with, uh, you know, hundred bucks worth of crap and get going. Odds are good most people and already had a phone with a camera in it that they could have done something with. If you ever want to start on YouTube, certainly don't let equipment slow you down. It didn't make any difference for me. I was too big of an idiot to know how to use any of it anyway, so it really didn't matter where I started. It was just important that I did. As far as why I ended up going with the Lumix G95, more or less just reputation. Uh, this camera is a at this point, kind of an older model. Panasonic hasn't released an updated one in a while, which to a point is somewhat frustrating. So, you know, for me, this is a brand new camera and it's still using micro USB. It's not USB-C, which is super frustrating. But the plus side of that is there are a bazillion of these out there. These are very popular YouTuber cameras. They're very popular photography cameras. So you can read reviews of these things going back like four, four maybe five years at this point and people have continually been comparing them to the more upscale Lumix cameras and comparable Sony cameras and stuff like that. And these guys are always punching uh, pretty far above their price. At the time that I bought just the camera, I think the retail on it was, or when I say retail, I mean what I paid for it was $6.99 without tax and without any accessories. So like I said, by the time you buy anything and bolt it on one of these, like a decent size SD card, that is a, what's called a UV filter in the front of it, which isn't, this one probably isn't actually a UV filter. All it really is is a piece of glass that protects your main filter. But yeah, by the time you get an SD card and some longevity appliances, like, you know, wrist strap, you get a storage case for the thing. In my case, I bought an insurance policy with it. So yes, an extended warranty, but one that it specifically covers accidental damage. I think that was a four year policy. Cause again, I use this stuff out in the shop. I guarantee you this thing's gonna get dropped and it's going to take a beating. Whether or not it survives it, we'll see. But yeah, by the time I did all that, you're in it for a thousand bucks. I think with current pricing, you know, if you wanted to count the voice recorder I'm using and the lav and all that stuff and the tripod, uh, disregarding the laptop and the software, my current YouTube setup is probably $1,500. So compared to what a lot of people do, this is nothing. But com compared to what it takes to start, this is a ton. But all of this stuff ultimately has been paid for by the channel. So that's awesome. You really can't complain when you have a hobby that self supports and hopefully in the future, it will be a business that does more than support itself as a hobby. So there you go. For the most part, this is the stuff I've been using on YouTube for the last four years. Uh, in total, almost 4,000 subscribers, right around 800,000 views across the whole channel, which over that period of time doesn't sound like much, but it's a lot for me. I just looked at the Broken Life channel and lifetime watch time was like 39,000 hours, which again in YouTube numbers is nothing, but 39,000 hours is an insane amount of time. And it's just crazy that even people in aggregate would choose to watch that much of anything I've ever done. So it's extremely fl flattering that people do like watching. I appreciate that people are still coming to watch more stuff. Uh, hopefully you didn't find this too terribly boring to watch. Again, this is not something I'm going to do every day, but probably once a year we'll do kind of a gear roundup. I'll make a prediction and say that by next year, we're gonna be on to full on wireless mics because it's becoming a hindrance for me to remember to hit record every time because I screwed up most of the time. And the wireless mics will dump straight to the camera. So that won't be an issue anymore. And with any amount of luck, I'm hoping to add a real GoPro to the mix. So you know, retire the action cam guy here, but keep its $12 windshield mount. That's another thing that worked really good and go to a uh, full-on GoPro for out in the shop because I watch quite a few channels where that's all they do and their content comes out great. The camera's a lot more durable than, you know, the Lumix will be and it's just a lot handier solution. You know, you see how easy these are to deal with. So hopefully we have a good enough year this year to get those things done. I uh, just rattled off another thousand bucks of equipment right there. Easily a thousand bucks of equipment. Also maybe be able to afford some training to actually learn how to run that camera. So we get some videos that start to look decent too, instead of just be crap on all fronts. Speaking of crappy videos, I'm glad you sat through this one. We'll catch you on the next one.